Marina Morales from Magnify Wellness. I am here with Ana Sierra, PhD in International Psychology, Psychotherapist and Counselor. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Sierra. I am the owner of a small private practice in Washington, DC, and I have been practicing here for the last five years in the mental health field for the last 15 years. Uh, so happy to be here and talk with everyone today. Thank you. Uh, so tell us about yourself. How did you get into therapy and counseling? So um, I started off just like any young person trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I went from the wanting to be a vet, wanting to be a teacher, wanting to be maybe a uh, and from the, but psychology, just the study of the mind kind of attracted me to the field to just find out more. And before I knew it, I had completed a lot of courses in psychology through my undergrad. So I decided to stick around with it because it was still more very, very much interesting. Um, when I continued working, uh, when I finished college and continued working in, my, in the field, I realized that mental health services for people of color um, were not the best and there were a lot of um, incompetence in working with them but also just lack of uh, providers so that's what kept me going mm -hmm. um, and it's very interesting that you got into international psychology how is that different from um, the general psychology and oh, what draw you to it so um, the 90% of the field of psychology, counseling, psychotherapy, research, like academia work, everything that you hear about how people heal and what are ways to help people heal are rooted in studying uh, societies that are called weird societies, right? So they are wealthy, educated, um, you know, uh, so their social economic status is higher and they're also, um, so it, we're, we're, we have a, a a population that has been studied that doesn't reflect the rest of the world. We only the only thing that we know about psychology is that 12% of the of the world that where we've been studying psychology throughout since psychology was born. So international psychology looks at what other cultures, what other countries, what other people are doing and how we learn to heal because ancestors have been healing for more than what than, than than the history of psychology for many 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 years before that so it is the interest of learning and figuring out what works for others that is not in this cookie cutter westernized view of how we should heal so that's why it's, it's a new field international psych so yeah that is very interesting um do you ever feel stigmatized stigmatized does um do people make you give you judgment for practicing um, psychotherapy, which is something that um, is still not as prevalent as it is. You mean with uh, general public or with, with peers and, and clinicians? With people in general. People in general. Uh, yeah, so people do uh, seek out therapy services and I think that for every community that looks different. Um, for uh, people from the Latinx, Latino, Latino, Hispanic, you know, uh, culture, uh, it really comes down to the last straw, right? The last solution in their toolbox coming to therapy because it is highly stigmatized, because it is highly uh, seen as a sign of weakness to ask for help in that way. Uh, so it's part of that cultural um, value of keeping, you know, keeping things inside the home, kind of just not asking for help and um, that's one of the reasons why we have a difficult time um, not just engaging but keeping uh, uh, people from Latinx descent in, uh, in, in you know in therapy. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting because um, I also grew up with that uh, with the thought that asking for help is in some way a form of weakness when you know, I've, I have learned in the way that it's in some way yeah. strong to ask for help. Exactly, exactly. So it's, it's a courageous step. Mm -hmm. um, but in the culture, we are taught to self-solve everything. 
and that you know when we do find look for help there are different people we could go to like elderly people or maybe the doctor but not the therapist no one we yeah. don't get we don't get that message that we could go to a therapist mm-hmm. um can how can someone um yeah with covid that's happening how can someone cope with what is happening right now being isolated from from the modern world and in some way going back to their origins and reflection reflecting on how they were raised covid has affected so many areas of people's lives you know including housing health mental health financial mm-hmm everything that it 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 is a huge um impact i i actually have talked about this as a global trauma uh that is experienced throughout the world but it has affected more some people than others um i think that with the isolation especially for community um community like the latinx community um it's a lot more difficult because of the social aspect of the culture of getting together a lot having you know that time to spend together kind of like the families everything so that is now that that's not possible there's a whole lot of things that need to be readjusted and the best way to cope is to adjust to it right to come to, come down to terms that it is it has changed the way we socialize it has changed the way we communicate it has changed the way we are with our family members and friends and adapt and try to accept that reality even though it's not easy to do that um that's why therapy is very helpful to process and to have some more support in how to think about that and how to make sense of this experience and do you think that once uh we reached immunity um will things go back to normal when it comes to socializing I don't believe so. Um I don't believe it will be normal as we knew it. I think it will be a new way of being that is different, very very different. If you think about just trauma in general, whenever whenever there's trauma, um and even if like somebody was not directly impacted uh as far as health or mental health, there's this common knowledge that, you know, of this of the health issues. So if you think about it let's say that we are tomorrow we, we all wake up and it's all back to this normal right mm-hmm. and you picture yourself walking into a grocery store and not wearing a mask and people really getting super close to you then you have these things called flashbacks you think about what you went through and you're thinking about these germs and you're thinking about you're close to me you're thinking about I'm wearing no mask so we cannot take those thoughts away uh immediately that is going to take several years even post the time when we handle the health crisis so the health crisis is going to be a little bit more stable but the mental health crisis is going to have a spike in just how people are responding to this new normal that's something that i i i can see even now from treating patients so um when there uh, sorry being isolation um it has happened to me has um brought me to reflecting into my own thoughts and things i want to change things i don't like and what is one of the first steps that someone can take towards changing and i think if if during the time of lockdown there is something significant that was removed in the way we cope with life right distraction mm-hmm. going to dinner going to a concert hanging out with friends just talking about other things focusing on other things instead of focusing on ourselves so we have a whole big gap of mind space that's going to be filled with thoughts and feelings that you were not touched on before and that is the reason that is how isolation impacts the person because if the per, if they say that you do notice that that mind space is a little noisy as far as things that are internally going on 
um, it means there are things that, you, that we haven't dealt with, right? We have to go in and figure it out in therapy, how to make sense of these things, what is going on, you know, how come I was happy before this and now I'm miserable, even though I didn't get sick from COVID, I didn't get, I, you know, I didn't get fired from work. I'm supposed to be happy and you're not happy, but just figuring out what is the mental impact that um, all those thoughts and feelings um, are doing, right? And these could be things from past experiences. It could be things from how our relationships are with family, with friends, and reanalyzing kind of your life goals, trying to make sense of it. It's, it is really a process of grief. It is a loss. We lost the way we lived, and it is never coming back the same way. It's going to come back, but it's not going to look the same. So it is that process of accepting that we that was lost but also processing those feelings because we cannot just accept things like this right we're human it takes a process to get there so figuring out what are those thoughts and feelings journaling helps but also processing with a therapist is one of the best ways to get some support mm -hmm. and i want to go back to journaling um how is it that i can put my observations into and a picture so there's many ways of journaling um i think that most people are very familiar with the diary format which is writing in about your day but it really can be anything let's say that you want to track what times of day you're feeling sad or anxious or things that do make you feel upset You can journal throughout the day. You can journal once a week. It depends really on that work that you're doing with the therapist. You can like paint as well. You can do, um, you can do mood charts and like checklists of things and how you're feeling and what you're thinking about. What, what brought up that feeling? And what, is there a pattern that I'm seeing in these journals throughout the week? And if I speak to certain people, then I see my mood changes. Or if I'm isolated, am I better or worse when that happens? So it is about figuring out what are the triggers, but what are the moods, emotions that are coming up so that you can target those, right? And work with, um, work on feeling better about that specifically. So stress is a huge one, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even waking up in the morning and knowing you can't go anywhere. So you're gonna have to figure out what to do at home. <laughs> yeah. And that is stressful because we've been doing that for months, um, writing it down whenever those, those thoughts and feelings come up. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that um, not approaching uh, mental health um, services is so prevalent in people of color well we have something called like two barriers that are happening so we have the individual right the individual grows up thinking that they shouldn't ask for help that they should keep things inside the home that um if anything no no if anybody knows something is wrong in the family then somehow if we talk about it we're being disloyal to the entire family when that's not the case so first are the cultural beliefs after that you have the after you break through that resistance let's say that you've had we've had client people that realize oh my goodness this is not a good way of seeing things i should ask for help then they go to help in the wrong places right they start uh asking people that know something like the neighbor that helped somebody else or that, you know, not that religion is not important, but sometimes, you know, there are different roles for everybody, but like pastors have a role, um, priests have a role, therapists have a role. They're not the same, uh, but it's just that the, the running towards the people that you feel you can trust, right? You can trust those people, but you cannot Uh, assume that they'll know what to do because that's not their role right or or and then after like let's say accepting that there's something that maybe a professional can do um you have the question of 
okay, so how do I do this, right? When you come to therapy, to f- try to find a therapist of color, if that's your preference, or somebody that speaks the language, really, um, there's not many of us. There is actually one of me for every 100,000 Latinos that need therapy. So I cannot take on everyone, uh, unfortunately. And finding a person that speaks the language is really hard. Finding it that it, uh, uh, and in a way that is affordable is another one. And also um, getting used to the dynamic of talking to a person one-on-one, especially now with COVID, we're virtual. Um, and culturally, we do like being in spaces with other people. Yeah. So there's yes. many barriers. So in regard, and it, 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 despite all those barriers, my caseload continues to be high and also like a waiting list of people because of the high need of it. So it is about the person accepting, trying to find a way to figure it out and get the access to, to care. And then also finding somebody that they feel comfortable with, right? So that is a privilege that not community, community um, that the majority does not, has that luxury of just, you know, finding somebody through like a listing and then they speak their language, they, they're affordable, they may have insurance and everything and everything else flows. So it, there's barriers, systemic barriers for our people. Yeah, and how, what are ways that um, privileged people can help those who cannot afford or don't have, um, as you said, someone that cannot speak the language, how can they help us? Well, yeah, there are many ways. I mean, and it's definitely um, counseling and psychotherapy when it is um, pri- you know, in private practice or in every every community. Most therapists would be able to, con- to take in clients using interpreters. You don't need to speak the language in order to build rapport with a client. So interpreters are available more and more so than clinicians. And clinicians can also become more culturally competent in how to work with the population so that they can manage right the issues in therapy in a way that is not harming the client. Um, I think opening up the access to that um, And even when I work with interpreters to work with indigenous communities where I don't speak the language, right? Uh, It could be an indigenous language that I don't know. uh, It's opening that access for for people. So if there was more advocacy or or just openness or uh, willingness to do that at a higher level, like the bigger organizations implementing supports for counselors and psychologists to do that, that would be a huge shift in how we are treating our people and how much access they get and support they get. Wow, thank you so much for for all your insight. Um, What are some resources that you have provided um, or used that can help um, raise mental health awareness? I would say that, you know, as Latinos, the one cultural value that we hold very dearly we ha- we hold really hard on in our life for this one is this concept of aguantar to endure yeah and 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 just i just want to challenge this culture this value because even though we have been taught throughout our lives that if we do endure pain psychological pain problems in the home that somehow we're doing good and that's that's not necessarily an indicator of us doing well because sacrificing ourselves for the well-being of others is a nice concept but if you are not well yourself you cannot do good for others remember that you know we come first it's not selfish to do that also I've heard this in my clients it's not selfish to do it if you are well and you will, your mental health as well, your physical being as well, you're gonna be the best helper in the world, right? You're gonna be the best, you know, <laughs> uh, person to help. But if you're not okay and you're just enduring the issues, the pain and holding on to them, you're going to do more damage, not only to yourself, but to others, right? Without, without really wanting to do that. So I would challenge that we view ourselves more of 
I'm putting myself first so that I can be a better helper if that's the motivation right that we want to think of others and that's a nice thought but have to be well ourselves mm -hmm. yeah thank you um is there any organization that you would like to shout out to or um promote your own oh sure so yeah thank you for having me here i appreciate it i I am, um, we do have a small private practice in Washington DC where we open up spots every season, every semester, like school semester-ish. Uh, so spring, summer and fall and winter for, all, for free psychotherapy. We have bilingual clinicians that take those spots in order to uh, open up the access to those who do not have insurance mm -hmm. and cannot afford it. So, um, so if you want to call us, we know we can screen you and put you on a list or give you a clinician if we have an open, open spot. So feel free to call us. Thank you. Uh, do you have any last message for our audience? I, I think every every person that's involved in, in, in efforts to advocate for mental health, mental well-being uh, does a critical job at this. And um, or in your profession or in people that you know, you have a circle of influence, right? We have our families, our friends, our peers, our coworkers, all those people. Start speaking about mental health so, so that you can become that advocate in your circle because even if you think that that's not gonna be a big deal, it makes a huge difference for others around you to hear you talk about mental health. Opens up that that language and that conversation. And that's how we begin. Like one by one, we begin to break down uh, the stigma. So keep on doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sierra. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you have a good day. Bye-bye. Oh, <laughs>